everyone, thanks for joining us for week three of The Greatest Man. I want to remind you that this is a safe place to take your next step. So open up, share with your group, let them encourage you, let them pray with you. This is a safe place in community. Time now to hear from Pastor Penn. So as we've discussed in previous sessions, Jesus was fully God and fully man. He wasn't 50% God and 50% man, half God, half man. He wasn't 90% God and 10% man. He was completely man. He laughed, he got hungry, uh, he had friendships, he cried, and he was fully God. We also learned that Jesus provided the only way to salvation uh, by dying on the cross for the sins of the world, and that through Him alone and exclusively, salvation can be found. But that brings us to a very interesting question today, and that is this. If Jesus was completely man, did He ever sin while He was here on earth? Which is a, a compelling question for us to dive into because it tells us a lot about the character and nature of God and who Jesus really was. And it's a fair question. It's a fair question that if we believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man, that he had the same struggles, that he trip up like regular man did. So statistically, uh, people kind of fall into different camps on this. They're a little bit all over the place. I thought this was interesting. 41% of adults believe that Jesus sinned while he was here on earth. And 40% of teenagers, when surveyed, who claim to be Christians, um, believe that he sinned. And then another 52% uh, percent of teenagers who attend uh, Protestant churches like our Baptist church believed wrongly uh, that while on earth, Jesus sinned like any normal human being. Um, this is troubling. It's troubling for several reasons, uh, not the least of which is that scripture teaches the exact opposite of that. In John 8, 46, Jesus says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you just believe me? And the author of the book of Hebrews said it this way in Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness because Jesus was fully God and fully man. He can empathize what it means to be a man. He says, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. And then Peter in 1 Peter 2, 12, uh, puts it this way. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Over and over and over again in the New Testament, we have people testifying to the fact that Jesus was in fact sinless. He lived a perfect and sinless life while here on earth. Those who testify to the sinlessness of Jesus are those who knew him the best. They were the closest with him, which if you're going to convince a group of people that you've never sinned, it's probably not the people who spend the most time with you. But that's exactly what we have when we read the New Testament. His friend Peter several times says that Jesus was sinless. John in 1 John 3, 5, again, his brother James, what would you have to do to convince your brother that you didn't have sin? Uh, James 5, 6. And again, Paul says that Jesus was without sin. Judas, the betrayer, later came back and recanted of his lies. And in Matthew 27, 3, says he betrayed Jesus and was wrong for doing so because Jesus was without sin. And so while it's true that Jesus was fully man, he was not merely a man. He was fully God, fully man, the God man, two in one. And the only one, he's the only one that has ever been. There's never been another one like him. And what Jesus accomplished with his death on the cross and his resurrection would be able to provide a way for salvation for us only if Jesus went to the cross sinless. If Jesus sinned, just like everybody else, not only... Do we have a problem with what Scripture teaches us about Jesus? But we have a problem with Jesus, the salvation that Jesus provided in and of itself. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, God made him who had no sin 
to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In reference to this verse, um, the church reformer Martin Luther, uh, when he talked about it, he, he talked about this thing called the great exchange, that there was an exchange on the cross, that it was the exchange of God's righteousness for our unrighteousness for his innocence, for our guilt, for God's wrath, for God's glory. Like we, we be, there was this exchange that took place when Jesus died on the cross. But if Jesus wasn't sinless, there was no exchange. Nothing was traded. It was just one sinner dying in place for another sinner. That's why Jesus had to be, as Peter put it, a lamb without blemish or defect. He had to be the once and for all bodily sacrifice for sin, providing the peace by his blood on the cross so as to present us on the other side of the great exchange as holy and blameless before God. Jesus, through his death on the cross, provided the only exclusive way to salvation only because he was sinless. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't tempted. He was tempted. He was tempted in the wilderness by the enemy. He he, he was tempted, but he didn't give in to those temptations. He lived his entire life and he never sinned. And also, uh, he didn't carry with him the sin stain that all of humanity has because of Adam's sin at the very beginning when everything fell apart. Because he was born of a virgin, Uh, the federal headship of Adam, the the sin passed down and inherited from generation to generation, wasn't a part of Jesus. Again, he wasn't just a man, merely a man. He was fully man, but he was also fully God, and he never sinned, which made it possible for the God-man to die for us. That word for is really powerful that substitute word, that he was there in place of us, for us. He stood in our place, and not just ours, but the place of all sinners. Those whose behavior and acts are so unpleasant and so awful, it is not polite to talk about them at mixed company. Jesus took those sins upon him. He was perfect and sinless a spotless lamb without blemish, and he took the most atrocious sins on himself and died for us. Isaiah 53, 5 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. Isaiah goes on to say, For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Paul in Romans 4 said he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins. 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also suffered once for all sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. 1 John 2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus' perfect life, the sinless, blameless sacrifice, on the cross, in my place and in yours. His death for ours is what makes 
his death, burial, and resurrection effective for salvation. The sinless Christ's death on the cross at Calvary paid the full penalty of sins for all who believe in him. Thus, what was lost at the fall was given back at the cross. Just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, God was able to redeem the world through one man, the sinless Christ. Did Jesus ever sin? Absolutely not. While Jesus was sinless, we know that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. However, because of Jesus, all our sins can be forgiven. Your next step this week, take time to pray, reflect over your life. What areas of sin do you need to confess and turn from? Again, we want to hear your stories of life change through this series. So connect with us by emailing us at connect at northpbc.org.